Hi, and welcome to the 79th TiddlyWiki Hangout. I'm Jeremy Rustin, the inventor of TiddlyWiki, and today I'm joined by some uh, new faces who are um, uh, three members of the team that are working on the TinCan API, which we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. But first, let me ask everybody to introduce themselves. Archna, hi, how are you? Would you like to say, um, introduce yourself, say where you're from, and say something about your work with this project? Hi, I am Archna, and I'm from India. I currently work with a US organization, Kudya, which is into open educational resources. I have done MTech in biotechnology, and after that, I worked for a research, as a research analyst for some time, but then my interest shifted to education sector, and that's why I thought, uh, let me get into OER. And after that, since last more than one year, I've been working in this domain of open educational resources. So uh, my interest for joining this X API was to see how OER can be integrated with that, and then of course, I met Ed there, and I thought, okay, let me uh, let me see what opportunity does Tedly Wiki have for OER. So this is my first hangout uh, hangout with uh, you guys, and let's see what opportunity uh, explore for OER and how we can, you know, uh, collaborate these two things. That's brilliant, Archana. You were actually very very faint. I could just about hear you. Um, and the people watching the recording will be able to rewind and put the volume up, hopefully. Um, but if you're um, speaking um, f far from the mic, or if there's a volume control to adjust, um, that would be useful. Um, Archana, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to the Hangout. Um, let me uh, now ask Bodo, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, say where you're from, and something about your work with the project? Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Bodo. I'm currently in New York. Um, I'm working on a an autonomous self-schooling platform for kids that can't go to school, and I'm looking at using TiddlyWiki and TinCan as as part of that process. Fascinating. Okay. Well, we'll um, as part of the TinCan section, um, I'll ask you to elaborate a bit about that system. That sounds very interesting. Um, and Ed, uh, a regular face on our Hangouts, uh, would you like to say hello, say where you're from, and introduce your work with TiddlyWiki and indeed TinCan XAPI? Absolutely. Yeah, my name is Ed Dixon. I'm from Las Cruces, New Mexico. And uh, m my, uh, my entry into all this was to build a student uh, teacher notebook uh, using the best features of TiddlyWiki, and the idea occurred to me to add a TinCan to that. And uh, since then, I've been able to build a pretty impressive team that's really targeting, uh, targeting getting that done, and I'm, I'm just very proud to be a part of it. Brilliant. Thank you very much for joining us, Ed. Um, and uh, Matt, would you like to say hi, say where you're from, and something about your involvement with the project? Hi, everyone. Uh, Matt Kennison. I'm CTO of IDS, a company that is focused on delivering education and educational resources to inmates in prison. Um, and we are in Nashville, Tennessee. Very excited to be a part of this. We're very, very interested in uh, in working on these things. We're already working with uh, one of the key companies uh, dealing with XAPI. That's uh, Roostacy Software, um, and we're we're just really, really glad to be part of this effort. Terrific! Great, glad you could join us, Matt. That sounds really interesting. Um, next, Nathan. Would you like to say hi? Say where you're from and something about your work with TiddlyWiki. Hi, yes, I'm Nathan Kane. I'm a developer from the United States, and uh, I've been uh, working with uh, TiddlyWiki Core um, for about a year, and uh, recently been working on uh, developing some plugins. Indeed. Great to have you here, Nathan. Glad you could join us. And finally, Nick, would you like to say hi, say where you're from, and something about your involvement with TiddlyWiki? Yeah, I'm Nicholas Spies. Um, I'm in South Asian Pennsylvania, Downingtown, not far from Philadelphia. And um, I'm really a, a rank beginner, so I'm uh, just learning how to make filters and, and macros and so forth. Um, but my intent is to um, um, adapt uh, TiddlyWiki for the purpose of writing books, say, um, and actually typesetting them in LaTeX and so forth, things I've mentioned before. Indeed, indeed. Great to have you here, Nick. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank so, you. 
Um, as I said before the introductions, um, the suggestion is that we'll go straight into the Tincan X API um, segment. Um, first, uh, uh, just for really for the TiddlyWiki people who are watching this Hangout, a uh, very brief introduction to what the Tincan API is um, for, for us. Um, in many ways, I think it's the missing link um, that closes the circle of using TiddlyWiki in education. We've already got a, a reasonable way to distribute uh, educational material in TiddlyWiki and an authoring environment that lets educators customize that learning experience to whatever degree that they, uh, that they want. What the Tincan X API gives us is a way to record students' progress uh, through learning objectives online um, while they're working through the material. So particularly what we hope to be able to achieve is make it possible for a student to complete learning activities within TiddlyWiki while they're offline to be able to, to save their changes in some way and then subsequently to be able to sync the, the um, updates to the Tincan X API um, online and of course to be able to do the same thing directly whilst online. So there's those two two goals, one slightly harder than the other, to make it possible to track progress through offline learning experiences and the slightly simpler case of doing it through online learning experiences. Ed, is that, um, I'll turn to you first, is that a fair description of what we're trying to do here? Absolutely, yeah, that's the whole idea, is so that those, uh, those efforts by the student can, uh, can be sent back to the learning rec record store. Um, for the teacher to have, you know, <laughs> it makes it uh, such such a more uh, powerful tool uh, when we add that component to it. Indeed, indeed, and uh, I the status on my side is I've signed up to help add um, it, with a cohort of people to uh, do the work to make this integration happen. Um, Ed has me down for um, overseeing the plugin development, so my interest is making sure that at a low level we achieve the integration with the existing API um, properly, correctly. Um, I, I, I'm particularly interested, as I say, in making it possible for the, that API to be invoked offline, so to speak, or there the, to be a, an offline story. Um, and I'm also hoping as part of uh, this initiative to update the core generally so that it has better support for talking to JSON APIs like the Tincan X API. So um, what I uh, think it would be most interesting to ask our guests to just expand a little on uh, some, some of what we heard in the intro. Um, uh, Matt, turning to you first, um, I'm, you were talking about um, uh, learning in a prison environment, in a, uh, which, uh, which was fascinating. I mean, I'd, I'd first, um, uh, for my own interest, be really interested to understand what's different about that environment from the env educational environments that most people are used to. Is it particularly resource constrained and, and so on? And I wondered whether you, <clears throat> whether you had prior experience with TiddlyWiki and, you know, therefore whether you had an opinion on whether TiddlyWiki itself has any um, properties that might make it particularly suitable for that environment. All right, thank you. Um, actually, I have no prior experience with TiddlyWiki. Um, I do have a, a good bit of experience with other wikis, including a file-based one that was called TinyWiki that I really enjoyed uh, actually developing on for a while. Um, and and I, I find the entire concept of a self-encapsulated wiki with its with its uh, its core engine, as well as its data, well encapsulated enough to be able to carry, very very interesting. Um, you know, we have a lot of trends right now in education where encapsulation of the content is a challenge, and and the uh, the the formatting the the interoperability and all of that, those are very interesting challenges. I'm, I'm very curious how TiddlyWiki will approach that from a, from a standpoint of being a more generic wiki tool, but, but obviously having some, uh, some interest in the education community for expanding it for that use. So I, I have some interest in those areas. As far as where, where we are and what we're doing, yeah, prisons are very much of a resource-constrained market. Um, we, uh, we, we put out, for example, tablet computers that have every possible configuration 
Uh, we custom design these things. We have them where they are absolutely 100% offline, have no RF gear in them whatsoever. In fact, one of our clients uh, who are recently deploying for um, wouldn't even allow us to put an FM radio, which is often a, an option we put into these units, um, simply for fear that the inmates may be able to reverse engineer it and, and, and create a broadcast unit out of it. Um, so, that sounds really interesting, Matt. Let me just um, um, uh, emphasize that, make sure that I understand correctly, that it, it, it's, it's commonplace in, in prison environments for inmates to be given devices, tablet devices that have no connectivity at all, not even to an internal network. So it's not commonplace at all for them to receive tablet devices at all. That's the pioneering ah. end of our, of our work. <laughs> <Yeah>. However, <laughs> however, in those places that are accepting it, the majority of them are still very much reticent to allow inmates access to even an internal network. Now, we are working. Mm -hmm. I just uh, met some great folks. I'm out here in uh, Long Beach at the American Correction Association Conference, and I, I just met some fantastic folks who are doing some really, really neat work with online and offline learning resources. Um, and who are, who are creating some great content. So very, very interesting things happening in this field where they're pretty much the, the, the prison industry as a whole mm. is technologically behind by at least about 10 years. Um, mm. And so we're thinking of creative ways to work within that restricted resource environment. And I'm actually very, very interested in the work Bodo's doing um, and seeing ways that we can collaborate with what he's doing and, and, uh, and, and perhaps share some code because he's also dealing in some very resource restricted environments. And, and, and when I say resource restricted, I don't just mean no access to the internet. I also mean, you know, very little infrastructure access, very little, uh, you know, and, and some, some concept of how communication ought to happen between the participants that is that is moderated or, or restricted so very very interesting he's obviously working in a much more open model um but but with some of the same themes apply um that, well that's a great cue uh bodo to ask you to um uh, expand a little on what you said in your intro introduction um uh, about um uh, yeah. uh yes. building a learning environment um, yeah, very much like like Matt. Um, so so we uh, deploying into areas that don't have any connectivity. Um, these are rural villages uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. You can imagine um, where there there aren't um, there isn't much infrastructure. Um, there aren't any schools in those areas. Um, these these kids are completely illiterate. Um, they're unlikely to ever go to a school or to see a teacher. And uh, what we need to do is, is deploy t tablets to those areas with, with content allowing them to, to learn literacy and numeracy uh, without their necessarily being a teacher. Um, and may, may I ask, what, what area are you referring to? Well, there's, there's, there's numerous areas like this, pr predominantly in, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, Afghanistan, wow. um, uh, Central oh, and, and, and Southern America. Yeah, yeah. Um, because that would pertain to, uh, let's say, Native Americans, um, you know, on reservations here in the U.S. as yes, well. We can imagine it would, yes. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the key thing that, that we need to consider is that uh, because there's not co no connectivity, um, all of the, the learning infrastructure is going to be on the device. So our LRS is going to actually sit on, in the device. Um, and uh, it's unlikely that these devices will ever be connected to the internet. Um, current deployments work in that the, the data is stored on the device for, for uh, several weeks, if not months, and, and uh, we get folks to go out to these villages and collect that data for us. Uh, so it's a very manual process. We need to make sure that everything uh, works as a standalone um, piece of uh, infrastructure. I ask a question. Does this relate in any uh, remote way to the uh, one laptop per child initiative that that Microsoft kind of destroyed uh, some years ago? Yeah, it's it's very much um, related to that, mm -hmm. but it's we're definitely not a part of that, and we're definitely yeah. taking things in a, in a very different approach. Mm -hmm. um, that's really interesting. Um, a question for both of you, I think. Um, I, the, the, there's no online connectivity, but I, I've read about in some 
environments file drops being used. So I think actually this was Central America, um, uh, possibly Cuba or somewhere, where um, it was commonplace for people to shuttle data between people's yeah. computers using hard drives. Have you come across that as well? well used it. So, so we part of the platform we're developing is mesh networking. Um, the kids themselves will be connected to a mesh network, which over time can extend to, to a great, uh, a great range. Um, and and one of the other um, things we're looking at is uh, mesh network extenders, which which broaden the 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 range of those of that mesh, but also to include um, base stations with our solar charging units that can pick up data from satellites. So there's a there's a new company called Outernet, which um, has a uh, a satellite receiver able to to receive about 2.5 terabytes of data per day um, and the idea is that we could um, we could use that that approach to update software and content but it's going to be more difficult for us to get any data back from these units we still need to to make sure that it works offline That's and so and so some of the work that we're doing if I may jump in um, focuses around ways in which you can encapsulate XAPI data, uh, make it available for, for pickup at some point in the indeterminate future, but, but essentially be restive until that point. And, and I'm actually real interested, Bodo, in talking to you, not to get too far off key, but uh, talking to you about, um, about different mechanisms for basically creating a point-to-point -point distributed LRS. Um, because I think in a mesh context, it would make sense for all of the nodes to contain the LRS, or at least to, to take responsibility for portions of it, sort of like a BitTorrent client. But that's a whole other th discussion for another day. Um, and great. Uh, Archna, you were able to um, join us again, to rejoin us. Um, uh, are you, uh, is your microphone a bit louder now? Yeah, is it better now? Oh, actually, you're still quite quiet, I think, um, compared to the other participants. Um, often, no, that sounds much the same, actually. Often it's a matter of the position of the microphone, um, but um, try again, Archana. Okay. Oh, that's they're, they're, now you're definitely much louder. That's much better. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, that's, the, that's the reason I'll be. So we, there's been a few themes that um, uh, have have come up in the last round of the conversation that I liked. One particularly is the store and forward idea. So I think um, some people's idea of mesh networking is a means to establish a you know a remote synchronous link um, to um, another node in the network that's distant, um, and that those two nodes are meshed together simultaneously. And obviously that would be a precondition for things like voice chat across a mesh network. Um, but I think what Matt's talking about um, and Bodo may be talking about is, is intermittent mesh, mesh networking um, where the participants in the mesh network are only, um, are only occasionally connected. Oh, let me, um, we've actually been joined by a couple of new people, um, one of whom has just pointed out that he works in mesh networking. So let's ask them both to introduce themselves. Um, Alex, uh, have you got your microphone? Are you able to introduce yourself? Alex, hello. Would you like to say yeah, hi? Um, I'm Alex. I'm um, currently in my kitchen. Hello, <laughs> listening. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, long time to do with the user, based near Manchester. I carry on listening. I'm making some excellent. <laughs> Um, and Jed has just messaged that he doesn't have um, a microphone, so uh, isn't able to um, uh, isn't able to introduce himself. But Jed, please um, do uh, do share what you can uh, in the chat window, and uh, I will attempt to at the right time read uh, read it out. Um, so yes, it was this uh, this concept uh, that um, came up when Matt was talking about mesh networks where the participants are intermittently connected. So therefore, there's not necessarily a synchronous connection between the two distant nodes that are communicating. It's more of a store and forward model like email. 
Um, and I like, I'm interested in that model because it works on the even cruder technology of you know walking around with USB sticks, um, as well as being a good match for real world network performance. Is that a fair summary of the um, of the situation, Matt Bodo? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Great. So, and one of the things I think I heard Matt saying was that you've already evolved standards for store and forward of um, X API transactions. Um, you probably got less clumsy words for saying it, but um, is that a specification think, or a protocol that we can take advantage of? I think you guys are uh, are. Sorry about that. Sorry, you um, you dropped out for a second there, Matt. I didn't quite hear your response. Apologies. Those those are as of yet aspirational ah, goals. Okay. Right? They've not been implemented Excellent. yet. But we do have we do have we have talked about it. We've talked about some of the syntax, and uh, and we we are definitely in. Uh, we're very very interested in implementing such things. Okay. Well then, that's... because at the moment at the moment what we have is we have. Um, we have essentially uh, created mechanisms whereby we can store the JSON and then mm -hmm. forward it. And so that's not really so much a protocol as an approach. Mm -hmm. um, but we'd like to we'd like to make that much more robust, and we'd love to hear your input. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Well, I mean, the sort of thing I'm um, thinking, obviously, is that we would um, have a, a queue of unposted um, performance claims. I'm not sure what the correct ob uh, noun is there. Um, and uh, that we'd post them when we, uh, when we get network connectivity. Um, the sort of thing I was interested in as well was how we would indicate to the user that there are pending um, achievements to be uh, uploaded um, you know, they're kind of UI questions. Um, from what I've seen of the API, it looks as though um, the writes that we would want to do to the API um, are um, a, a basically a post with a confirmation. So there's no, um, it's not a complex multi-step transaction to update these things. It's a single post. Uh, does that sound right to you guys? Oh, actually, sorry. We're, we've uh, Matt and uh, Archner have left us. So in fact, it's just Bodo. Bodo, do you have sufficient API experience to answer that? Um, no, unfortunately not. We we're also at the early early stages of, of this project, um, so we we rarely coming to this group to to work on these problems together. Excellent. Okay. Well, then I think we're doing a good job of mapping out. Um, some of the aspects of the problem space. I mean, as I said, I think the being able to um, uh, cache uh, achievements offline, I think, is well, not an aspirational goal, but it's the more demanding of two goals. Doing it um, when the completely online case is clearly um, much more straightforward um, from an engineering point of view and from a user interface point of view. Right. Yeah. I also, I um, I've got a lot of experience in in uh, correctional education. I was a, a computer teacher for like 15 years doing that. So I, that's where uh, where I came into contact with Matt, and and I really do support his efforts there as well. So um, that uh, that was my connection in with him. But yeah, I think the uh, encapsulating that somehow to where it can it could be either peer to peer. Or even sharing the files directly. I mean, there's so many. That's that's the uh, that's the advantage of using TiddlyWiki over any other th platform I've come across, is how flexible you've designed this to be. And uh, you know, there's so many different ways it could be done. It's a matter of trying to choose the best one. I think at this point, which mm -hmm. is what I want to be sure we're integrated with you because I'm pretty sure you, you'll get it there. <laughs> From the, what um, I, yeah, no, indeed. Um, I think the. Um, uh, oh. Sorry, I completely forgot what I was about to say. But yes, um, uh, it was it was to uh, to agree wholeheartedly. Um, uh, Jed's just joined us again. Perhaps with the microphone this time. Um, he's just clarified that he's working on a PhD in wireless communications with a focus on cognitive radio, which is one way to make ad hoc networks. And he, um, as I think he's actually explained that on previous hangouts. And he uses TiddlyWiki for uh, organizing the research. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a sort of um, 
for me, it's an interesting general topic because one way of looking at TiddlyWiki is it's a response to the centralization of the internet. You know, it empowers people who don't have access to a server to do things that would normally be the exclusive domain of people that have a server. So I think that's a very, um, it's quite an aggressive decentralized um, agenda. Um, and uh, I think it matches really nicely uh, onto these um, uh, onto these educational scenarios. Um, I I guess in terms of mapping out what needs to be done and stuff, Bodo, is there anything else? I mean, it might be useful to um, just talk through with you any other areas of of mutual concern, so to speak. Um, I was thinking when you were talking that one of the potential advantages of TiddlyWiki in these kinds of projects is the extraordinary ease of um, prototyping that Tiki works on um, and devices w with the stock Firefox for Android. So um, the, you know, the component parts that one needs to build a demoable, uh, yeah. offlineable um, system are you know, already there, but obviously that's not to say we wouldn't, I think what you're thinking of, the LRS running on the device um, would obviously let us do things that we could never do as a file loaded into Firefox. Yeah, uh, so from, from my side, unfortunately I haven't used TiddlyWiki all that much. I've only just gotten in contact with it, so, um, but what I've heard and, and what I've, I've heard from Ed as well is, is that this is very likely to be a, a a really good solution for us, um, especially with regards to the, the presenting of content and, mm. and um, like you said, the, the, the creation of a prototype uh, especially would be really easy. Um, I'd like to, to again, um, uh, agree with you on the, the, your comment that you previously made on the, the, the de decentralized approach. Um, it's, it's something that is quite key, quite core to what we're doing. Um, uh, very likely. There's, there's unlikely to be any centralized servers in these areas. We need to create a very decentralized service. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so I'm not too sure what else I can add there as yet. Well, um, it may it, part of what I, uh, um, part of what needs to be said is me to, um, uh, to to explicitly offer my help. Very interested in in, in discussing this topic. Um, I think. Um, so I think, think there are ways that TiddlyWiki could be um, brought to bear on it um, without too much um, effort, really. Um, I can't remember whether it was you, Bodo, or Matt that talked about formats, um, uh, pointing to, I think, the, the question of uh, in what format is it most um, uh, generally useful to have educational assets. Was that you? Yeah. Uh, no, it was Matt that mentioned oh, formats. Okay. Because um, I think that's another place where TiddlyWiki um, possibly does quite well is that by reusing HTML5, yeah. um, you get a kind of built-in cross-device experience. You can't necessarily save changes on all devices, of course, but um, uh, but on those that we can, then you get you know the full uh, read-write experience. Yeah. Um, the it may be interesting. Oh, sorry, Nick, please. Yeah, I was wondering if there are um, standards uh, for educational uh, records. Uh, uh, pretty much that's what the XAPI encapsulates. Okay. So we've, we've been talking about it as an API, but <clears throat> what the API exposes, you know, is a data model that um, mm -hmm. I guess, um, you know, has, has, has been, um, has done quite a good job of matching the industries and needs because it's now you know, quite a successful dominant API um, as I understand it. I, if I could add, one of the standards that we're also looking to, to include is, is a metadata standard to, to tag the content. Is that, how is that handled within TiddlyWiki? TiddlyWiki aspires to, be, to, to expose a general purpose model for users to structure and tag textual data and in fact image data as well. Um, and so, uh, it, it, in the uh, the idea is to expose enough sort of low level facilities that that things like that can be done in a variety of ways. Um, there's some kind of obvious ways, which is a, a, a TiddlyWiki's data model is that there's a 
a bag of named tiddlers, uh, which would be equivalent to card index um, cards. Um, and um, what was I trying to say? Oh, um, the the to give information about the wiki as a whole, a normal thing to do is to use a naming convention for the tiddler. So um, if you, I don't know, if you have an author field, I mean, you might name it prefixed with the Dub Dublin core prefix, um, but then use that to compose a longer and hopefully unique tiddler name, like this is the name of my wiki. Um, and then uh, outsiders who want to inspect the metadata just would know by convention which tiddlers to inspect. Um, the individual tiddlers can also carry metadata, um, but uh, there's often good reasons to keep that metadata separate to from the item that it's a metadata item to. So we've yeah. got things like tags yeah. for, for doing that. Um, and again, tags are a, an expression of a uh, of a small set of more fundamental capabilities, the ability to model lists and the ability to iterate through things in lists. Um, you know, that's exposed as tags, but those capabilities, um, the underlying capabilities can also be used to structure, uh, to create subtly different structures than the existing um, tag semantics. So right. kind of like Excel, it's, uh, it's supposed to be, in terms of the data model, really quite low level and you know, permit, for instance, people to work in a hierarchy, to think of it as a hierarchical graph of content or a network graph of content. Um, you know, it, it tries to support a number of different ways of thinking about the data being modeled. Right. Um, and one of the goals of doing that is, of course, to be able to pick up existing metadata standards where we can. So um, you know, to, the, to the extent that we've got metadata standards that are defined by a URL, for instance, um, a, a reasonable thing to do is to put that metadata in a tiddler that includes the URL in the title. Um, and then you know, that's a nice way of labeling metadata um, so that it can be understood by others. And an example of the, I mean, it's an example of linked data, but it's an example of linked data done in a native tiddlywiki way. Right. Um, I, sorry, Nick, you were going to ask something? Yeah, I wonder, uh, um, I mean, to, not to change the subject, but uh, did I show you last week this um, navigation menu idea that I had for... Uh, no, um, I, I, the we, I think perhaps we might do that um, after, after we the finish session. the, okay. the tin can um, session. But um, right. uh, but you, we're always interested in seeing um, stuff that other people have done. It's one of the more popular chunks. Um, okay, uh, Jed just said in the sidebar that you showed it after the hangout ended. Um, so in fact, I think I would have left by then. Uh -huh. um, uh, Okay, so um, just in terms of next steps on the project, Ed, um, I uh, would very much much like to come to one of the cohort hangouts. Um, when's the next one? Uh, the next one, Thursday, is when uh, they do the uh, X, um, XAPI WebEx uh, for the cohort group. Um, and they, they're doing it in two different time zones. Uh, I've got those links on our Google group page, uh, which I'll set up a, a link for in the in the group chat here. Okay, uh, great. I probably can't do Thursday um, uh, this week, in fact. Um, for I mean, but but I'm I'm also thinking more about um, our team hangout. Um, probably rather well, I'm than thinking the... maybe this time because we do need to get a little bit more organized in there. Uh, I thought maybe after the uh, after the X API uh, uh, discussion. Uh, after that WebEx ends, we might do a, a Google Hangout afterwards. Okay. Uh, but I would be happy to set up one so that our code team, uh, which you're obviously leading, uh, could get together at your convenience, whatever is a good time for you. Um, yeah, well, let's, uh, I mean, let's, let, let's figure it out by email, but I can certainly give you um, some times over the next week that would work for me if that's a good start. Awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, anything else on the um, 
uh, on the Tinkan X API stuff. Archana, I'm very aware that we've um, we got your microphone fixed and we've hardly heard from you. Um, uh, did, was the foregoing discussion echoing for you? Okay. Actually, I'm so sorry. Today, this internet connection is not stable. So that's why ah. I missed most of the Hangouts. So I will see the archive of it and then I'll... Uh, maybe in the next call, I'll, uh, I'll say something about it. Okay. Well, the, um, uh, it, it, interestingly, your experience of the internet dropping out during the call is actually um, very relevant to what we were discussing, that um, uh, although um, we might think facetiously that people in Silicon Valley you know, live in an imaginary world of perfect uh, continuous connectivity, in the real world, um, being offline or being intermittently online um, is frequently a normal state, and it's always interesting for me, to, obviously, to think about that as a software designer. You know, are we doing enough um, for these offline states? Right, right, right. Absolutely. <laughs> so that Excellent. Well, um, guys, if uh, if you're happy, I was going to move on to uh, some more topics that we've got lined up for the hangout today. Um, I hope you'll stick around. Um, we'll be talking about probably fairly specific aspects of the project, um, uh, but it might give you a flavor for, um, well, both how we run the project, and you can see it's, you know, it's a very conversational project, um, and uh, might give you some insights into the capabilities of um, well, both of TiddlyWiki and the team as well. So any, any further thoughts on the Tinkan X API stuff before we switch over? Um, yeah, I would say that since in the United States at least the uh, educational standards have were the vary state by state, that it would have to be very um, malleable indeed in order to meet the standards of each state individually, and that would also apply to the penal systems, I would think too, um, for that application. Any thoughts about that, Bede? Um, well, you know, luckily on our side, and I and, and I say that carefully, but luckily on our side, we we deploying into areas that don't have any of those requirements. Uh, okay. We're focusing specifically on on what the kids need, out of, as opposed to what um, any centralized schooling system thinks they need. And, yeah, yeah. and so we we've, we've got Very the luck good. that luxury of of just focusing on the kids. Very good. Very good. Right, yeah, I would also add that uh, as far as the malleability of the XAPI, it is very, very malleable. Uh, basically, what they're doing is they're just sending uh, what was worked on, who worked on it, and what was you know, and what was the result of that action. Mm -hmm. So, the, regardless of what standards may be employed by any of those states or or countries, uh, they should be able to match that within their LRS. Mm -hmm. Um, indeed, you um, uh, Ed sent me the um, URL that I. I don't think I'll be able to lay my hands on uh, immediately for a simulator of some sort, which was basically an HTML form um, that had a text box for each of the fields um, in the uh, in the uh, achievement posts. Um, and looking at that actually gave, is the best thing I've seen for just giving us a very giving a very clear idea of what TinCan is actually tracking and how how it's represented. Right. Cool. So I'm going to turn to the um, questions that have been posted in the Q&A window. Um, the first is from Nick. Uh, is there currently a way of naming the main title of a TiddlyWiki running in TiddlyWiki desktop the better to recognize exactly which file of the same name you have open? Um, so uh, mindful of our guests, let me um, start by just showing you what Tiddly Desktop is. I think actually it's very relevant to the um, educational scenario as well. Um, it's a custom application that's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux that acts as a custom browser hosting one or more TiddlyWikis. So in this main window here, it's listing two TiddlyWikis that are registered with it, so to speak. When I click the Open button, um, the wiki opens in a page of its own, in a window of its own. If I add a new Tiddler, uh, you'll see we've got auto-save with automatic um, saving of changes. 
So it's equivalent to um, the other way of achieving this is to run a Firefox extension, which gives Firefox similar but not quite such uh, elaborate capabilities. Um, it's not necessarily something that uh, makes sense for students, or not for every student, um, but uh, in an educational environment, you could imagine it being useful for the um, uh, for educators who are customizing the uh, the learning experience. I'm sorry, I couldn't see the window there. Was somebody coughing to ask a question or make an observation? No. Um, so uh, next question is, I think, that uh, there's kind of an issue that uh, the windows are identified by their title. Um, and the title, in turn, is defined within TiddlyWiki. So TiddlyWiki has a control panel where you oh, okay. can configure various settings. And you can see here, um, it says TiddlyWiki pre-release. So if I change that to Jeremy says hello, um, then sure enough, the window changes that. And I think that, um, Nick, your question was, what if you've got a number of um, t uh, TiddlyWiki documents that have the same title, and therefore, presumably, it becomes hard to distinguish them from the window menu on your platform? Um, is that correct? Is that the issue? Yeah, I just uh, found in my own case, maybe I'm using a, uh, an older version, uh, that the uh, title was sort of a generic title, for, or it seemed to be, rather than related to what is on my disk. Um, it's, it should be the, the site title and subtitle uh, combined okay. together. But yeah. I think, you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're... I just may have misread it, uh, in other words. The, um, but I mean, in, in fact, of course, the scenario you raise could occur. It'd be quite reasonable to have multiple wikis with the same title, and you currently know there's. I mean, mm -hmm. the only the only way I can think of to resolve this would be mm -hmm. to put the URL in the window oh, title, and obviously there's an issue with the length of that. Um, mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, next question from the Q and A panel, um, also from Nick. Not exactly new, but I would like to make a strong argument for realizing a widget that represents a path to some root for those tiddly stacks that are hierarchical in structure. Lists can represent trees in a straightforward manner, so why not generalize? Um, so a uh, tiny bit of background here that, um, uh, as I uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, TiddlyWiki is, um, uh, has a very simple data model that's designed to um, allow a number of distinct data models to be used within it. Um, so, for instance, here in, at uh, well, this is a local copy of tiddlywiki.com, we've got a hierarchical table of contents which is displaying mm -hmm. hierarchical relationships between tiddlers. Um, and if I click on one of those links, then I'm I'm at that tiddler. But that mm -hmm. path to get to the tiddler is, I think, what Nick's talking about, that you could imagine um, having breadcrumbs across here, which would say, working with TiddlyWiki, slash, saving, slash, yeah. saving with Internet Explorer. Um, I can actually show you a picture of what I had in mind, if you'd like. Excellent. Um, let me stop screen sharing and hand over to you, Nick. Uh, brother. Um, let's see, how do I get just one window sh show here? Drag it on here. No. Um, uh, we've found in the past that um, it's uh, it, the, the screen sharing works best when you share your entire screen. Um, but if you're in yeah. a multi-monitor mode or something, that may complicate that. Oh, I, I might be able to enlarge it here and show it with preview, which will make it stick rather than going away. I have two uh, monitors, so yeah. That's um, okay. Cool. Google Hangouts to spontaneously combust. Yeah, sorry to take so much time. I believe, yeah, here it is. Okay, uh, we're, yeah. Let's okay, we're showing. Now, my cursor is showing up here. This would be the root, NS, and then ideas, invention, and potential inventions. And then, let's say, automatic transmission is the current tiddler that you're on, and then these are subtopics of that, uh, you know, further away from the root. And so within, um, you know, the any tiddler, you would hit the path button, and it would act like a tag, and produce this 
kind of a map. Mm -hmm. So you'd be able to directly uh, jump around rather than having to go to a um, essentially a table of contents along the right mm -hmm. side and uh, achieve the same thing. I think it would just be a speed issue to yeah. be quicker. Uh, um, no, that quicker. makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, what you're asking for um, could be achieved. Macros could be written to um, achieve that. Yeah. But um, well, quoting from you, you're saying you'd like to make a strong argument. One thing that's really important is um, that um, with a project like this, you don't need to make that argument to me. Um, my, I've already got a very full plate of things that need to happen <laughs> to the core, and this is a great example of a feature that can be implemented as a plugin. And you'll, I'm sure you've heard me saying this before, but basically, if something can be done as a plugin, it's probably faster um, to do it as a plugin. The, you know, the core schedule is pretty punishing. Um, if I knew what I was doing, I would have done it. Well, um, so, so, so that's my... Um, I, sorry, preface <laughs> that by saying um, d do make the strong argument, but don't make it to me. You need to make the strong argument to the group, and I think that's about um, uh, helping the, you know, many people in the group who do have um, a pretty good grasp mm -hmm. of wiki text, and I think right. with a careful description of what you're after and the kind of illustrations that you're careful, capable of producing, um, you would communicate very quickly to them, or help you know trigger mm -hmm. for them um, figuring out um, what would be needed to 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 do it. Um, yes, I, I think uh, it was Mario um, who's uh, showed um, actual graphs that you could move around the uh, edges and um, you know. Um, oh, that's Tiddly Map. It sounds like. Yes. Right. Yes. And I. I hope I have the right person, but um, that was very interesting. But again, I wasn't able to reproduce uh, even after dragging in the, what I was supposed to, uh, you know, which was supposed to enable it. But I haven't really communicated with them either because I've been quite busy doing other things. So. Uh, well, um, just leave it there and then. You know. Timely. Um, uh, timely intervention from Jed in the chat window. He's saying um, to, I think to you, Nick, that um, if you go, can mm -hmm. give a list of what you want, then it doesn't sound too horribly difficult to create. So that sounds mm -hmm. like a, a, a positive challenge from yeah. Jed. Um, and I'm, I'm sure I speak for um, Jed, who is microphone list, that that kind of specification and clarity you know, makes a job like that much easier. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> excellent. Uh, Thank you. Uh, no problem. Let me just dismiss that. Qu oh, I didn't need to dismiss that question because it's already gone. So the other thing that I wanted to spend um, a few minutes on is a new feature that's just gone into um, the pre-release. So this isn't yet available on uh, tiddlywiki.com. Um, and it's the plugin library. I showed um, an early prototype last week, um, and uh, in fact, functionally, it's not changed an enormous amount, um, but I have made improvements to its presentation, which makes it a lot easier and clearer to figure out what's going on. So what I proposed to do now was to show you that, um, and we'll just sort of talk through the, the scenarios where it's designed to be helpful, um, and then talk a little about um, uh, some of the implications of it, because uh, I think I emphasized last week that um, the reason why I got excited about the plugin library work um, was partly tied up in um, the journey I'd taken to figure out the, um, the, the right implementation, and it turns out that implementation has a number of other interesting potentialities. So, um, if everybody's uh, good with that, let me screen share again, and um, let's have a quick look. So the plugin library lives in the control panel. Um, the plugins tab um, still primarily, or uh, by default, consists of a list of the plugins that you already have installed. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, there's a Chevron on the left, which you can open to give you further information about the plugins. Some, but not all, plugins provide a README. 
Um, you can also disable plugins, causing them to be um, striped in that incredibly psychedelic way, um, and uh, and re-enable them. Um, the what we've added is a new tab called Add. It's slightly clumsy wording, um, and what it shows you is a list of the registered plugin libraries. So the way that um, this is set up to dowiki.com slash pre-release. Um, by default, there's only a single plugin library registered, and you can see the URL here, to dowiki.com slash pre-release slash library slash index.html. Um, so again, it's pointing off to the pre-release version of the plugin library. And uh, if I click on this link, um, you can see the underlying tiddler um, that contains that information. So it's got the um, displayed title of the plugin library um, and its URL there. And then when I click the open plugin library um, after a second or two, and obviously we do need to be online in order for this to happen, we get a listing of all the plugins. And I can switch between plugins, themes, and languages. And these are all the um, all the plugins in each of those categories that are available in the library at tiddlywiki.com. Mm -hmm. um, there's still, um, it's quite easy to imagine improvements to the user interface that I'm about to show you. Um, the difficulty, as ever, is actually um, implementing them. So, you know, implementing them means providing enough basic support in TiddlyWiki for the necessary UI interactions that we need. And in some cases, um, you know, some of that support is lacking, so it's quite hard to do some things. However, in the listing, we get the title of the plugin. Um, sorry, the description of the plugin is what it's currently called. So it's a plain text description and its title. Um, you get the version number of the plugin in the library. And then for those that are installed, you get a little subtitle um, saying what version is currently installed. And in those cases, the install button changes to reinstall as well. Um, so if I choose a plugin that I don't have loaded, like KTEX, I click the install button, and two things happen. It instantly gets, well, it doesn't happen instantly because it needs to make a network request, in fact, but the plugin gets marked as installed, and we get this new yellow banner, which is intended to make it crystal clear to users that when plugins are modified, they need to save and reload, and so those buttons on that um, uh, on that warning banner are clickable and they're a you know, shortcut way of invoking those functions rather than disappearing off down here. Is there any reason not to have, combine those since they have to be used in tandem? They... Um, or is there a compelling well, reason not to... Well, I'm the buttons that we already have. So all, yeah. all those are is... Yeah, yeah. ...that we have. Could the buttons be... Yes, well, you could imagine a button that does a save and reload. Mm -hmm. um, a single button, and it would just be a new t a new page control toolbar button, and we'd use it here instead of these. The in in some cases, I mean, here I'm running in Chrome, so you can see the save button is red, indicating there are unsaved changes. Um, mm -hmm. In Firefox, of course, with Tiddly Fox, you've got auto save. So in fact, in that situation, you do only need to click reload. Mm -hmm. Um, the only other feature I've not shown you is that, um, as you can see, there's a ridiculous number of plugins in the library already. Um, one issue is that some of those plugins are really for internal TiddlyWiki purposes, and um, there's no reason for a non-developer to install them. So, for instance, the translators tools, the upgrade tool, and there's a new plugin called Plugin Library that contains the components for building the plugin library. So those three are examples of tiddlers, oh, sorry, of plugins um, that are really not intended for end users. So I do, uh, would like to find a, a clean way to filter those ones out so that um, they don't confuse people. Mm -hmm. um, there's what there is, though, to tame the ridiculous. Um, long list is a filtered search box. And if I do a refresh, I will obviously lose those plugins that I just installed because I'm in Chrome. Um, but, uh, and reopen the library. Um, I, 
what was I trying to say? So you can search for them. Um, so that's the end user exposed functionality. The situations in which it works, hopefully, is basically every environment in which you can use TiddlyWiki. So here, um, I'm actually running as a local file URI, um, but I'm referencing the online plugin library. And that's intentional, because that's the situation that most users are going to be in where they're not running their own plugin library. They're using the main online one. Um, and this seems to work fine uh, in all the browsers that I have tested. So in other words, we don't run into any what are known as same origin problems um, due to browsers being anxious about a file at this URL, which is a file URL, being able to talk to this file that's at an HTTP URL. Um, so well, uh, you may remember last week I was explaining that one of the reasons for doing this is that um, the main tiddlywiki index.html was getting too large because of the number of translations that we've received. So one of the things that I'm going to do as part of this change is make it so that those translations are not installed by default um, in the index.html. Of course, they wouldn't be installed in the empty.html either. Um, I may provide a all oh, I can't even type it, all languages file. Sorry, still really can't type that. Um, that, that is a um, five megabyte wiki or whatever it would be loaded with all of the languages. Um, but the expectation is that users would just install the languages that they need. Um, so any questions about that? That's just a rather lightning run through of the functionality of the plugin library as it's exposed to end users. Um, as, oh, I know I should have said, it, it will also work for a wiki loaded in Tiddly Spot. Um, so you can have your wiki in Tiddly Spot install plugins directly from tiddlywiki.com. Um, uh, Nathan's just saying in the sidebar, tiddlywiki.com itself should certainly keep all languages installed, though. Well, I'm saying that the index.html, which is the page that you see when you navigate to tiddlywiki.com, would not have all of the installed plugins, and that enables us to trim the size of the file from 4.5 megabytes to 2.5 megabytes is, is the reason. Um, I'm, not re I'm not too obsessed with the size of tiddlywiki, but... Um, I think a poor experience for people navigating to tiddlywiki.com, you know, on a over a slow connection is certainly worth avoiding if we can. Um, is that what did did I understand what you meant, Nathan? Hmm. Right. So French people visiting tiddlywiki.com, what? should happen and doesn't at the moment is that uh, we provide nice straightforward flagged links with a you know using the language flags we've already got um, for each of the language editions and not all of those exist at the moment but that would be a empty.html and an index.html um, for each language so then hopefully um, people who are on the tiddlywiki um, oh, sorry, on the French version of TiddlyWiki, they can get everything done by visiting tiddlywiki.com slash French. I mean, it's not going to be a, a URL as simple as that. Um, and Nathan's just saying in the sidebar, maybe we could use a server plugin for EOIP to default, oh, GOIP to default smartly. Um, well, that's an interesting thing. Um, of course, the, it brings us to how the plugin library is implemented. Um, so one of the constraints that we have with TiddlyWiki at the moment is that it's hosted on GitHub pages, which are entirely static. So we don't have, we can't do any server-side scripting. Um, the really obvious way of implementing the plugin library is to have a bunch of JSON files stored on tiddlywiki.com, um, which any tiddlywiki can just reach up and retrieve um, <clears throat> in order to load the load the plugin contained in it. The problem with that is that the browser same domain origin policy um, prevents us from using XML HTTP requests, which is the normal way 
of loading files from a browser, we're not allowed to do that to a different location. So it means that a TiddlyWiki on TiddlySpot or stored on your local hard drive um, wouldn't be permitted for security reasons to access these JSON files that are part of the TiddlyWiki.com website. Um, there's a nasty hacky solution, which is something called JSONP, um, which I don't propose to discuss why it's nasty and hacky. I'm sure there's, hopefully, there's lots of articles on the internet <laughs> explaining why it's nasty and hacky. And so what we've ended up with instead um, is this um, quite unusual architecture. And let me um, just demonstrate what's going on behind the scenes by poking around with uh, developer tools. So again, I'll refresh. Um, first thing we'll look at is some material that comes up in the, um, in the console here. So I go to the plugin library tab, uh, open that plugin library, and you can immediately see some messages here. Um, they're prefixed by plugin library and by browser messaging. Now, what those relate to is that we've the that URL identifies an HTML file, which has been loaded into an iframe behind the scenes. So here you can see there's an iframe with style display none pointing at that URL. Um, and what we're seeing here is the communication between the main window and that hidden iframe. So uh, the plugin library, so that's the contents of the iframe, first of all, is saying, I've received a message. That message has these fields. So there's a URL, which points to the skinny URL. It's the standard Tiddly web format for retrieving a skinny list of tiddlers. So it's got all the fields, but not the text of those tiddlers. And we've got the verb get, which obviously corresponds to the HTTP verb get. And we've got some cookies, which is some material that uh, the pl that's needed on the um, by the other end, so to speak. So the the outer page making the request provided these cookies. The plugin library just echoes them back again. So we can then see a message being received. Oh, if I scroll up a bit. Um, um, uh, we can now see a message being received by what's labeled as browser messaging. That's the component within the host page. And you can see that the message, oh, it's not very clear at all, is it? The message's got a big fat body um, and has, if we scroll down past that, um, we can see it's got cookies, status, a URL, and the verb get response. So this what we saw there in the body is the content of the requested URL. So what we're seeing here is um, actually a straightforward HTTP transaction, please get me this URL, that instead of being sent out over the web in the normal way over HTTP, is instead being sent user br using browser messaging to the JavaScript that's running inside that iframe. So then that raises the question of what the JavaScript running inside that iframe looks like. And I think we can open that, can we? Um, so, uh, not much to look at. If we look at the source of it, um, you can see that first is a standard HTML file. Um, there's a script block which contains that skinny tiddler list that I talked about. So it's a list of all the plugins in the library with all of the fields of those plugins intact, apart from the text field, which has been removed. And if we scroll past that listing, then there's a little block of JavaScript that does two things. It listens to messages from other windows, in this case, from the main window that the iframe is embedded in. Um, of those messages, it looks for get requests. And then it looks for a particular URL. So in the case of the skinny tiddlers URL, what it returns is that list that we saw up there with no further request. Um, for requests that start recipe default tiddlers slash, um, then we uh, do some funky URI encoding. And then we make an HTTP get to retrieve the associated file. And then depending on whether we find it or not, we respond with a 404 for not found or a 200 for success, in which case you can see it's returning the response text. In other words, the text that was read from the file. 
So this HTML file is not a tiddlywiki. It's um, got some bare bones JavaScript, or what is that, 50 lines of JavaScript or something, which is sufficient for it to act as one of these peculiar HTTP servers sitting in an iframe. Um, so uh, very laborious explanation of the mechanism. But it's, uh, and perhaps I should emphasize why it's important. Um, and it's because the, uh, by default, browsers place very heavy restrictions on what web pages can do in terms of interacting with other sites. And as it happens, particularly stringent, most browsers impose particularly stringent policies on files loaded from a file URI. Um, and uh, this blasts through that and gives us a way to freely connect um, to the plugin library from anywhere. Now, the next step is you saw here how we've got a very simple server that understands um, just a few URIs and that we use that as the plugin library. The next step is to make it so that the built-in HTTP server that's already in TiddlyWiki, so TiddlyWiki both in the browser and in the server, has the code sitting there for understanding get requests, for instance, for retrieving tiddlers. And at the moment, that code is inert when we run on the run in the browser. It's only used when we run in the server. So the plan now um, would be to connect that existing HTTP server code to this new window post message mechanism. Then what that will allow us to do is any tiddlywiki that contains those um, components, and it will be, um, my plan is that those components will go into the core from you know, 5.1.9 probably or something, um, that another wiki would be able to load it in an iframe and then um, retrieve data from it. So some of you will have seen Erwan's community aggregator. And this is a server-side piece of work where he uses HTTP to retrieve a number of separate tiddlywiki files to split them up into their, sorry, off number of separate tiddlywiki files off the internet. So these are things like Tobias's tb5.tiddlyspot.com site. And uh, he extracts the tiddlers, puts all of these tiddlers together in one big tiddlywiki, which then makes it really easy to search them. So that's an example, um, or I would treat that as an example of federation. It's an example of a node in a network um, uh, being able to retrieve and, in fact, send content to another node in the network. Um, and I'm particularly uh, interested in this idea of being able to achieve federation even for people who don't run a server. So the Ward Cunningham's smallest federated wiki project, which we've discussed many times on the Hangouts, has had as, a, as its primary goal for some time um, the pursuit of, of federation. And there's a big emphasis on visualizing the edit history of um, content when it's been forked um, and modified by, by multiple people. Um, you might say that where well, that was the emphasis of smallest federated wiki, tiddlywikis, emphasis has been on creating this uh, extremely customizable environment in which the entire user interface of the wiki is created out of wiki text. Um, uh, but, and uh, it's not really a but, because it's not a criticism of smallest federated wiki, its architecture is a conventional server-based architecture. The protocol um, that it uses for um, for federation is, in, is incredibly simple, as it should be. Um, it's that uh, a wiki exposes URL from which a JSON file can be retrieved um, containing the content of that wiki. Um, now, the problem is that because that's a JSON file, it's exactly like the TiddlyWiki plugin um, scenario. It means that it's not possible for an HTML file running on some other server um, to access that JSON file. We need to make the HTTP request to receive to retrieve the JSON file from another server. So that that's, has quite a big impact on the way that Smallest Federated Wiki works. It means that in order to participate in the federation of wikis, 
you either need to be running a server yourself or you need to be a guest of somebody who is running a server. Um, obviously, there's many people who can happily run servers, but um, if you're in the second category where you're unable or unwilling to run a server, um, then in a scenario like with Smallest Federated Wiki, you've got to find somebody that you trust um, to be your um, to be your host in the federated network. Um, and in some situations, that could be difficult. So um, this, I think, has emerged as a, as a really interesting difference. You know, I mean, we're all interested in much the same stuff, wikis, federation, decentralization, all of this stuff. And of course, the power for all of us comes from multiple explorations that are going on right now by lots of people all over the planet who are interested in this stuff. And for our tiny corner of that world, which is about um, wikis and federation, um, I'm quite excited to um, have made, I think, really good progress towards a way of building a federated wiki where basically the participants are on Tiddly Spot or GitHub pages. In other words, the participants will need um, the ability to publish their HTML file on the web. And I've just realized, of course, Dropbox is another option. So we can give people multiple options for publishing single HTML file on the web but to be able to federate with other people. So let me run through um, what that might feel like as a user. Um, I think, I'm, uh, forgive me if we talked about, I don't think we went through this last time. Um, but the idea is I've got my wiki um, that from time to time, when I wish to review um, material from other people, I fire up the federation function, which basically loads up the wikis that I'm listening to um, one by one via that iframe mechanism and extracts the latest content from them and then gives me a user interface to display that remote content alongside my own content. So uh, one commonly um, done way of doing this is something called twin pages, which is basically if I have a page with a, with a particular title, if any of the people that I'm subscribing to um, have a page with that same title, then it'll be displayed alongside my one. Um, so in the situation where we've got m multiple people working out their own perspective on a, a thing or an event or what have you, um, they can each write their own version but keep an eye on the other one's version, um, which I think is a... Um, is, a, is quite a powerful way of collaborating um, that um, has a kind of basic appeal for lots of us because, it, again, of its decentralized nature. In a discussion like that, there isn't a, a host for the discussion and a guest. Um, both of those, uh, both the participants of the discussion are on, uh, on an exactly peer relationship. They have the same capabilities and rights within that conversation. So, um, what I need to do to make any of the um, uh, any of that stuff work um, is to basically document the components um, that are created as part of the plugin library, and um, as necessary, generalize them. So, there's um, the plugin library has a specific thing that it needs to do. Um, is to neutralize incoming content. So when it reads the plugin catalog, um, those skinny tiddlers, it gets tiddlers back that have the tags and fields of the associated plugins. And we don't want to even temporarily load those into the wiki. So we blast away their tags field, their module type, and their plugin field. So as an example of an operation which the current mechanism is doing, um, that probably has a place in um, federating content um, because if I want to receive content from somebody and I don't necessarily fully trust them, I don't necessarily want to retrieve content that might include JavaScript that you know um, mischievously deletes or transmits my personal data. So does that all make sense? Um, I, uh, any questions or thoughts about Plugin library, what that gives us, the underlying uh, federation technology, and what that might give us. Yeah. 
Nick? I hardly know how I respond because I'm really, you know, I've only been in it maybe six weeks. So um, I'm a rank beginner, really. Uh, I'm blown away by the possibilities that offers. I mean, I, I've got, that's going to have to sink in for a little while. <laughs> well, one um, the yeah. point I was going to address actually from an educational point of view is that um, although what I presented to you was an, you know, a, a rationale in terms of installing TiddlyWiki plugins, and it's all presented as a plugin library, in fact, it generalizes to what you might call an asset library. So it's a, it's a mechanism for listing and retrieving content um, for, oh, of any type from a remote site. So, for instance, you could imagine some helpful person in the TiddlyWiki community publishing a wiki that exposes itself as a library in this way with, I don't know, flags of the world in it. You know, a, a, a nice way of, um, of what's uh, just, I was going to say clip art, but whatever the equivalent, clip text. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, uh, to be able to just be a library of useful fragments of material for incorporating into one's own wiki. Um, it's also easy for you, for anybody to set up to be a host of one of these things. So, um, uh, should you roughly that you can add um, a pointer to another plugin library to TiddlyWiki. So, um, one of somebody like uh, Eric, for instance, might um, publish his plugins as a separate Tiddly Tools library. Um, it might be that if you install any one of his plugins, that it contains that configuration URL to automatically include Tiddly Tools in the listing of available uh, plugin libraries. I, I have one comment. If you're trying to appeal to a general audience rather than to a group of um, highly skilled developers, um, essentially, um, you know, you're you're not addressing the general audience. I mean, you might be in terms of functionality, but but um, it's difficult to get into the authoring aspect of of uh, TiddlyWiki because it's not designed uh, in the same with the same um, uh, intent as let's say HyperCard was by. Um, Atkinson, you know. Sorry, Nick, this went. sounds important. I'm not quite sure what you're saying. You're saying that there's something about the way that TiddlyWiki presents itself that makes it awkward. For I, I, I find it difficult to find in in a uh, concise um, uh, place in one location, um, kind of to get a grasp on what on earth is going on. And uh, the conversations that occur during these uh, wonderful sessions uh, are largely over my head um, because I don't know JavaScript, uh, so I don't need to know it. But also, I have difficulty f um, sort of mastering all the uh, um, uh, you know intricacies of, of creating filters and and then. Um, you know, somehow using the results of, of what's been filtered in some meaningful way. Whereas I, I keep going back to Hypercar because I had a great deal of experience with it when it was current. Um, that yeah. was, um, you know, very, well, very the best, the best to thing users. to make a comparison with Hypercar is that the scope of them, you know, they're, they're trying to do something similar, and um, you know, I like to think of yeah. TiddlyWiki following in HyperCard's footsteps. Right. TiddlyWiki is way more ambitious. It's oh, customizable yeah. at a much deeper level. So, you know, the reason why HyperCard can present itself as being simple is because it is simple mm -hmm. and, you know, riddled with limitations. TiddlyWiki is an attempt to, to make a tool that's much more general purpose than that. So mm -hmm. that's, that's just a comment, really, on your comparison between the two things. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think one of the things you're saying there is the you know, the thing we discuss quite often, and we probably shouldn't discuss again um, right now, is is the documentation and how difficult it is for beginners. I mean, TiddlyWiki at best presents itself as a rewarding puzzle for people who are prepared to put the effort into 
to unlocking that puzzle. Um, so yes, I mean a very fair observation. But I think also in there, there's a concern about um, the uh, the audience for some bits of the Hangouts. So I mean in the Hangouts, we absolutely do um, uh, have quite big chunks that are um, somewhat developer focused. Yeah, we try to prefix them with um, you know more general introductions so that at least if people can't follow the intricacies mm -hmm. of the discussion, at least they can see how it fits into the bigger picture. Yeah. Um, well, that's come up before and there's been some questions mm -hmm. about whether we should um, split off the development discussions to a separate hangout, but mm -hmm. I've come to the conclusion that what really it, it reflects is the participants of the hangout, you know, the people who come. And of course I, I have a biased impact on that because I'm a developer um, and so necessarily this um, I think will can, for as long as we have, you know, particularly when people like Mario and Toby are here, who have quite a um, developer -y, um perspective. Mm -hmm. you know, that does give us that slant. Mm -hmm. Of course, even when we're not discussing developer stuff, we're sometimes discussing complicated stuff, as in, um, you know, intricacies of filter construction that we wouldn't expect ordinary end users. I shouldn't say ordinary; nobody's ordinary, but that we shouldn't expect um, end users with ordinary needs to be able to negotiate. So I think a lot of that is saying that the Hangouts are designed for the TiddlyWiki cognoscenti. Um, mm -hmm. And if, you know, to some degree, one of the things that you're saying is that there's things that happen on the Hangout that would terrify <laughs> an end user. And I think that's true. And I, I think we can be unapologetic about it. The, the yeah. purpose of the Hangout is for the community to come together. And the, you know, the, the community is the people who are, to some degree, already enthusiasts. And as I say, documentation point, um, well taken. Um, but I would, or something I almost said earlier on when you were introducing yourself, Nick, is that um, you have uh, one of the essential qualities of, uh, of an open source contributor, I think, which is that when you learn stuff, um, you're prepared to put in the work to leave a trail for yourself and other people to follow in your own footsteps if that's not too recursive. And I think that you know the, the solution to the um, develop to the documentation issues, it's about um, people who are able to being able to um, uh, you know step up and contribute us trying to lower the barriers to that as far as we can. you know we're very much aware that, making documentation contributions at the moment means essentially building a new version of TiddlyWiki and checking that it does what you think. So it ends up being a development task to a degree that we'd much rather that it, that it wasn't. Um, uh, yeah, just I almost agree with that uh, last comment by uh, Carl. Uh, so I've just realized, Carl, you're not shown in the broadcast, so I'm just going to switch you on. And let's pause for a second for a couple of introductions. We've been joined by Carl Husser. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Carl. Um, yes, but I think correct. you're uh, new on the Hangouts. Welcome. Glad you could join us. Thank you. Um, would you like to um, introduce yourself, uh, tell us your name, where you're from, and something about your involvement with TiddlyWiki? Yeah, uh, Carl Husser. I'm from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I'm actually associated with uh, Ed Dixon's project. Oh, OK. Uh, with ADLnet, and I used TiddlyWiki about three years ago to build a a graded branching scenario for an online university. Ah, awesome! Well, great that um, Ed's managed to assemble some people with the TiddlyWiki past as well. Great to have you here, Carl. Um, you. And secondly, uh, we've been joined by Eric. Eric, would you like to say hi and uh, introduce yourself, say where you're from, and something about your work with TiddlyWiki? Hi, my name's Eric, and I'm a TiddlyWiki user. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> yes, no, no last names, just initials. Um, <clears throat> no, my name's Eric, and I'm the author of Tiddly Tools and Inside TiddlyWiki, um, which is in progress. And uh, I live in Silicon Valley, the heart of the internet. Great that you could join us, uh, Eric. Thank you. Um, so the uh, Nick was uh, we were just talking through some of the issues around TiddlyWiki's approachability. Um, Carl made a comment in the sidebar. It's quite interesting. 
perhaps a visual tools interface could be wrapped around TiddlyWiki to provide end user tools. Um, so uh, I, I, I think Carl's asking whether, in effect, whether TiddlyWiki could be simplified and whether that could be done by wrapping more visual tools around it. Um, uh, Carl, is that, um, is that a, fair cap a fair way of capturing what you were trying to say? Great. Um, and um, uh, Nick was going to disagree. Um, uh, Carl's wondering about extensibility. Let me just jump in with a comment of, in this area. That I think this hits a topic that has been discussed quite a lot over the last eight to ten hangouts, and it's really who is TiddlyWiki for? And in um, the sort of folklore of TiddlyWiki, there's a pendulum that moves around, and I think the pendulum's moved in a particular direction. So for a long time, a concern for um, uh, you know, those of us um, working on TiddlyWiki was trying to make it easy to use for end users, the sort of mythical um, one's, one's mother type of thing, somebody who might be able to be using um, Evernote or OneNote without any difficulty. You know, what would it take in terms of engineering TiddlyWiki to get them using it too? And I think when we started that process, it was very necessary. TiddlyWiki Classic is apt to look overwhelming. And um, with TiddlyWiki 5 early on, we took a very rigorous attitude to keeping the user interface as simple as possible. Um, that's to say things like the number of buttons that you see by default, the number of lists that you see by default, and all that type of thing. Um, the what am I trying to say? That um, uh, what, I, what I think we've realized over the last few months is that in um, presenting TiddlyWiki as an easy-to-use easy to tool for casual users, that we risk losing what the community is actually telling us is the most valuable thing about it, and that's its customizability. Mm -hmm. So it seems as though... Uh, you know, there are people who are using TiddlyWiki without customization um, in the sense that they're not using external plugins and stuff, but they're still customizing it in the sense of managing their tags and their structures and so on in a way that suits them. So, yeah, But I want to emphasize that um, even though I've been talking a lot about HyperCore and so forth, I'm not restricted to, I mean, I am more of a developer than you know, yes, at the hypercard level. So, and I still find it um, a, a difficult proposition to to get into, um, you know, this sort of medium level of, you know, it's it's certainly not low level programming that we're talking about um, in order to get some real functionality out of it, um, as Eric mentioned. And, um, um, I, I, I feel that it does come down to documentation and uh, again that the user and developer documentation should not be segregated from one another. There should be a continuum um, so you sort of can move well. Uh, directly from one area to the next. Well, TiddlyWiki isn't really a separate, um, uh, it doesn't really split that concept at all. Like you say, it is sort of a spectrum from initial users on up. Yeah. What I'm finding is that in my writing of Inside Tiddly Wiki, um, I starting with with first concepts, you know, sort of micro mm -hmm. content as a concept, not as what's a tiddler, but just mm -hmm. micro concept as a concept, and then the idea of 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 systems that are self organizing through tagging and um, and that sort of the the ad hoc quality of of uh, writing for wikis, that kind of stuff, you know, we, we, we here assume that these are sort of, oh yeah, you get that concept, right, and it's just, that's what, a, a paragraph or so, but I'm finding that to actually adequately explain yeah. these ideas, um, they, need, they need to be elaborated for people, people look at, at, uh, at uh, TiddlyWiki and they say, what is this, they don't say, how do I use it first, they say, what is it? And uh, you know, the, so explaining it conceptually, putting that framework of, of mental understanding before diving into, you know, what's the syntax and how do you edit a tiddler. Um, and then there's a certain level of editing, which is simply I have information, I want to 
write it down. I want to capture it. And so there's basic things like entering content, linking things, tagging things. Those are sort of uh, you know, more simpler. But then when you get into things like customizing styles, um, creating macros, especially filters, which is where there's so much power, those things uh, need an additional level of conceptual explanation, but they also need sort of a roadmap of what are the props on the stage. You need to know what the setting is before you can start writing stories around it. You know, so if you think of this as a play, you have to sort of give people the description of all the props so that they know what kind of dialogue goes with those props. Yeah, uh, and, and so I'm finding that the it's sort very Yes, it's relatively easy, though, to do some sort of a reference, sort of like, here's what the filter is, and here's all of its various mm -hmm. syntax and meaning. It's much more difficult to explain why and when it should be used, and, mm -hmm. and, and how to take somebody's uh, conceptual understanding of what they're trying to do, and and have that converted into the proper syntax for, say, a filter. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes that's where people look at things like wizards. You know, maybe there would be a nice filter wizard that asks you about what you're trying to find and helps mm -hmm. you to construct the right syntax for it. Mm -hmm. um, but getting your head wrapped around these conceptually, like for instance, just the idea that filters work left to right progressively and that they're sort of, well, they filter things. Mm -hmm. uh, but understanding that it's a filter and not a, an equation or an expression or a, or a you know, and that there's some procedural quality to it. Uh, those are concepts beyond, that, that, that have to be in place before you can really successfully look at the reference material for filters and say, oh, which particular keyword do I want and, and what's the range of values that are allowed? Uh, so, uh, th and that's, that's kind of where I'm finding I'm putting most of my focus in my writing is on trying to explain things at a much more conceptual level mm -hmm. so that then people understand why that certain syntax exists and then when to choose to use it. Uh, right. Because looking up the syntax, that's that's another bit of documentation that needs to be, you know, and there are folks who are working on that. You know, mm -hmm. But but explaining the why of it is really the the tough nut to crack here in the terms of the documentation. Right. Well, and I think yeah. particularly because we, to the wiki conceptually is quite d different than most things that people encounter, and that's mm -hmm. doubly true at the development level. I mean, to wiki's internal architecture is mm -hmm. extremely alien to somebody from a conventional JavaScript background. The mm -hmm. architecture isn't chosen there out of perversity. It's, um, it's the architecture that emerges from analyzing the requirements. And you know the requirement mm -hmm. specification for TiddlyWiki, if such a thing was ever written down, is itself mm -hmm. very different than, than most tools. Um, but look, I'm mindful we're getting, um, I want to keep this discussion um, focused, because we've We've been through a cycle of agreeing that the documentation needs improvement, and we've many people have now put in a lot of work to try and make that happen. There's a separate uh, Tibli Wiki documentation mailing list, and there's been particularly Astrid um, and I think Toby as well. I'd mentioned of who've stepped up name? and Astrid. No, I mean, what's the name of the list? Of what? Of the documentation list. Oh, it's called TiddlyWiki Docs. But if you search in oh, the TiddlyWiki okay. mailing list, you'll for documentation, you'll see many references to it. I'm sure. So um, you know, I, I think where we are in the in the cycle of realizing you have a problem, figuring out what you're going to do about it, trying it out, and then looking back to see how you did, we're about halfway through. We've figured out that we have a problem. We've tried to figure out an approach for doing for dealing with it. Um, and I really think we need to see how that plays out a little before we make radical changes. I mean, you know, Astrid's attention, for instance, on the documentation it makes an enormous difference. I mean, she's really focused on the reference documentation at the moment. So, you know, if, if one looks at the problem of the documentation from the point of view of, is the job done yet? It's going to be a while before it's done. So, you know, you have to look quite focused. But if you look at the areas that... Astrid's worked on particularly, I'm, I'm picking out Astrid, but as so there's been many contributors to the documentation. We are making some improvements there. Um, but I think the, you know, the interesting, fun part of this discussion 
um, is it's again about the qualities of TiddlyWiki that are distinctive and I'm overlaying on it the suggestion that sometimes we get ashamed that TiddlyWiki is so difficult to use and that where I am in the cycle is actually thinking that TiddlyWiki, um, that may not be the best approach. It may be that um, our um, crankiness, uh, the, the distinctiveness of TiddlyWiki needs to be worn uh, on its sleeve. Um, and yeah, a lot of what I've said, I think, is, is really a, a quite specific commentary, actually, on the, the documentation that we've got right now on TiddlyWiki.com, so the area that we haven't really paid attention to since August last year is the material in Hello There and the stuff that's immediately linked to that. And it's that material that I think possibly makes the mistake of speaking to the user, you know, giving the user the impression that they're on a journey to a conventional, easy-to-use web-based tool. And it sort of rather conceals TiddlyWiki's peculiarities. And anyway, so uh, let me just also pick up a comment that Carl made, um, which is extensibility, making the tool useful for a wider population of end users. And that was a clarification of Carl saying he was wondering about extensibility. So I just wanted to pick that up. Um, TiddlyWiki is, um, exhibits uh, uh, one of the, what's the word? I, I think a defining important characteristic of open source projects. Um, so let me explain. The proposition with open source is that a number of disparate people can come together and decide on or find one piece of software that meets all of their needs together. Um, and that's magic because in commercial software, you know, everybody with the money commissions their own bloody software that reflects their own prejudices and idiocies. And we get, you know, it's very hard in a big company to get departments to share the same software, let alone individuals. So how does that happen? It is clearly not because all of our requirements are the same. And one of the things that illuminates the discussions that we have is those differences in requirements, you know, learning more about what other people are trying to do and the problems that they run into. So what TiddlyWiki does um, is provide a level of customizability, but also the ability to share those customizations through plugins. And it's a characteristic that you see in all the successful open source projects, and it's the mechanism by which you meet these diverse needs. So say if we have two people in the community who have directly conflicting needs. You know, one of them wants to do wiki to save automatically, one of them wants them to, to never save. Actually, that's an example of probably of a configuration setting. But uh, more complex behavior, say the synchronization behavior or something. The um, way that that ends up getting encapsulated is as a plugin. So plugins are a way to encapsulate the minor differences in requirements that the people in the community have. And TiddlyWikis, uh, both TiddlyWiki Classic, the old version, and TiddlyWiki 5, the new version, have pretty good um, plug-in communities where you can see this at, at play. And it has some other implications. It means that um, a, in the TiddlyWiki world, development isn't slowed down by the core. So TiddlyWiki, um, uh, like, I think, WordPress maybe has this characteristic as well. Extensions to TiddlyWiki have godlike powers. They can do anything to the system. Um, and that's really important. It means that if you can imagine doing something or if it is possible to do something in JavaScript on the web, um, then you can do it in TiddlyWiki. And you know, even before you look in detail at it, that it must be possible because TiddlyWiki doesn't do anything to stop the web working. So there's a question when you look at that kind of integration about how elegantly you can do it, you know, but, uh, but you, there's no question that you can do it. So that makes TiddlyWiki, I think, a uniquely limitless and extensible canvas for these kind of joined experiments. Um, uh, I'm going to just pick up quickly some uh, comments in the sidebar. Um, Google has this maddening thing that when I scroll up to read them, um, they tend to get um, scrolled out of the way. Um, the, 
Ed saying, I have to clip that definition of commercial software. I love that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's easier to say those things on the spur of the moment. Much more difficult um, to say them if one was being interviewed for TV <laughs> or something. Um, uh, Carl's chiming in with, there's been a bit of discussion there about editions, this idea that um, we the, the kind of life cycle of TiddlyWiki is that you pick up the core you assemble the plugins that you need. That makes a new thing that customizes TiddlyWiki. If you find that useful, then you share it with other people as an addition that they can use as a starting point for their own work. Right. And you know that to the point that we made before that TiddlyWiki is complicated. Um, I think that you can kind of imagine a pyramid that at the bottom there's Jeremy beavering away on the core code, and then there's people with you know, progressively deeper skills. And there's a um, uh, there's a question really about how far up you want to go. Often um, you can assemble plugins written by people below you in the pyramid, so to speak, in order to create a custom experience that does suit a particular set of users. TiddlyWiki's problem, in a way, is that its user interface has to suit everybody from the top to the bottom of that pyramid. And so it's by customizing it for particular user groups that I think you're... Jeremy. Um, exercising its flexibility. Eric? You have your pyramid upside down. I do. Yeah. The point is at the bottom because that's you at the very bottom and oh, yeah. everything builds off yeah. of it. Yeah, so and it's a hierarchy. Everything rests on your shoulders, Jeremy. Well, except that I think it's more like a banyan tree. Um, when I was on holiday, I saw a big okay. banyan tree. Um, and uh, we're incredibly unlucky in England that banyan trees do not grow here. Um, well, maybe they do in greenhouses. Kew Gardens. Kew, Kew probably does have one. So for those that don't know, um, a banyan tree grows from a single central root, grows out, and then roots drop down from branches, find their way to the ground, and before you know it, you've got a single tree, a single organism in mm. genetic terms that yeah. has Acres. multiple roots. And I think that's the model that we want for TiddlyWiki. And um, so where um, you know I, I hate the idea of being the single point of failure of TiddlyWiki, and one of the things that uh, well, is always worth reflecting on is um, yeah, that TiddlyWiki is pretty healthy in terms of contributions from others, and I think that uh, increasingly, um, you know, th those other people, their roots are growing deeper and deeper into TiddlyWiki, so we're getting hopefully a bit further away from everything, depending on Jeremy. Um, and there's now some discussion about um, curating the <laughs> Hangout discussions. Um, no, no, no. I mean the um, the mailing group, because it's very, very difficult oh. to assimilate um, what on earth is going on in the mail groups, with, um, you know, without um, an intimate knowledge of GitHub and all the rest of it. Um, no, I know that. It's, 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 a difficult, job. To, it's difficult to understand the mailing lists without um, about, without an understanding of GitHub. Well, I mean, there are references to numbers of specific issues that are um, that if you're not familiar with them on GitHub, you you don't know what they are. No. Oh, I've cured problem number of such and such, and. Um, you know, so are you yeah. talking about the TiddlyWiki group or the TiddlyWiki dev group or? Well, I mean, I'm GitHub. having a hard time figuring out, is TW5 and TiddlyWiki5, are they two distinct entities or are they, nope. they're not? The same they're thing. The same. Do you mean in terms of the prefix on the subject lines of emails that you receive? No, I mean the, the, the actual content, if it were realized, not in Google Mail, which is not terribly a flexible way of cross-indexing things and so forth, the the contents of the mailing list could become educational tools in their own right if Nick. they were realized as tiddlers. I see. Well, I'm, yeah. I quite like the idea of importing them as tiddlers, but I believe that... Um, so forgive my little rant here. I think that the groups are essentially a transcript of a conversation. And so um, like transcripts of conversations, they have misunderstandings, meanderings, yeah. people going off the point and so on. 
And what I've found with meetings is, um, I mean, you know, as in, in boring corporate life when we all sit around in rooms, is that sometimes the egotistical um, participants um, get to the fantasy that what we need, oh, this meeting's been really good. What we need to do is to record it. Then other people, it'll be like they were there too. And then if you've ever been the recipient of a please listen to the transcript, um, just please listen or read the transcript. Yeah, it can be deadly. It's yeah. excruciating. So I think my ambition is that we have a process, and it's a process that relies on people, um, that takes the gems out of the Google Groups discussion, mm -hmm. puts them somewhere else where they're curated and classified and cross-referenced and so mm -hmm. on. Now, you're absolutely right, of course, that, that tools um, can be imagined that would simplify that process. But actually, I think it's where once I was thinking of it as, wouldn't it be cool to build a bulk export tool that took everything we've got in the Google Groups and put them in a TiddlyWiki so we can do stuff with them? I actually think that's processing the backlog. And what's more important is to set up the ongoing process, mm -hmm. which is more like, I think, maybe a clipping oh, process. God. You know, somebody who's sitting reading the groups, you or Tobias, um, mm -hmm. selecting a chunk, copying and pasting, you know, then uh, pasting it and curating it in the TiddlyWiki. Hello, mm -hmm. Eric, sorry. Yes, I think, I think that uh, there's a couple of different processes and mechanisms involved here. First, there's the capturing of the good tidbits from the discussion groups itself. And as an example of doing that manually, Tobias has been very good about um, uh, his keeping up with, you know, sort of all his little, every time there's some little magic uh, trick of a, you know, turn of a trick that he does there, he, he writes it up and he posts a link on and everything. And, and that part of the capturing of the tidbits, yes, that's something that needs personal individual judgment and a curating. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then once they're captured though, now what he's been doing, he has his own particular document with his own particular style of, of usage and uh, uh, and he writes up his stuff in his way, um, and it's it's reasonably good, but it's not how everyone would approach it. And what I find myself wanting is some sort of a, regardless of who's contributing or how it's being curated, I want to have some standardized sort of, and when I say standardized, I don't know what standards I mean, but uh, uh, some sort of a knowledge-based mechanism. A, 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 a sort of a common understanding a about convention. here's how things are. A convention for mm. entering this. Yes, um, Toby's so, doing a wonderful job of it, but but can other people um, join in his process? Well, I mean, so let's um, take that a little. I think um, uh, what this could be about is um, a, a convention for marking up the tiddlers of a wiki that are designed to be reusable. So in practice, the tiddlers within a tiddly wiki, some of them are mechanism and templates and all kinds of stuff that aren't really of interest except as their role in part of making the wiki work. Mm -hmm. But then in other cases, and I think Tobias's stuff is a great example, we've got these really nicely discrete little lumps of knowledge. And um, I think it ties back to the discussion as we we're having about the plugin library where I was saying that um, uh, although I presented this as a plugin library, it's really an asset library. And I was also saying how anybody's TiddlyWiki could act as an asset library. So one of the use cases that I'm interested in is somebody within their TiddlyWiki being able to mark the content up such that what gets exposed as an asset library is named bundles of tiddlers, not individual tiddlers, but named bundles of tiddlers that can... Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it, the convention needed to do that is, is, it's not even really a technical convention. It's partly about a writing convention of encouraging people to write tiddlers in a way that promotes portability. So, you know, if you get people thinking in, it gets people thinking in a slightly different way. At the moment, we tend to think of the entire wiki that we're authoring. Um, but this way of thinking is about, thinking of the wiki being composed of these small parts that are explicitly, explicitly designed for reusability. We get the mechanism for that by virtue of them being tiddlers and there being that interoperability. But we're talking about conventions markup for adding higher level meanings, such as this asset needs that asset over there. 
if they install this asset, then offer them this asset as well because it might be interesting or relevant. Um, and yeah, isn't that exciting? It's exactly the kind of thing that um, the Federation lets us do. Um, well, that implies a, a packaging mechanism. Yes, the packaging part we've already got with a with a plugin. So a plugin in Tiddlywiki might be but better. And a higher or, level than plugins. Uh, that, that's what I'm talking about. Is a is a way a, a looser bundling. So a plugin is a like way. Like a package of manager. Well, I think we 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 need to establish possibly the terminology first because a package mm -hmm. is very similar to what a plugin is. So a plugin. Okay is a way of combining a bunch of tiddlers into a single indivisible unit so that I can copy it to you without dependencies. Um, but making a plugin um, you know, is a process. Um, you have to actually explicitly bundle these things mm -hmm. together. And so some of the, sometimes the assets we want to distribute will be plugins. Sometimes mm -hmm. I think they're more loosely coupled bundles. So but the idea could... of I might request from your wiki um, the tiddler called the meaning of life, um, and then your wiki embodies logic that says, well, actually, if you're asking for that tiddler, then you're going to need these tiddlers to display it correctly, and you probably want these tiddlers too because they. Well, that's them. all incorporated in something like app to get. Well, app to get is, I think, um, uh, pretty much um, what you've seen with the plugin library. App to get is a way of naming a resource and downloading. And all the dependencies. Um, yeah, yes, and the plugin library doesn't do much in the way of dependency management at the moment, but the intention is that it's that mechanism that I described lets us do that. Jeremy? Yeah. Um, the, uh, just, uh, sorry, I'm so sorry, but uh, Nathan's just said, what about just a bag of plugins? In fact, that is what is exposed via the current HTTP URL, um, uh, API. So um, the skinny tiddlers gives you the details of all the tiddlers in the bag, and then you can individually request the tiddlers within the bag. So we've in, we, it's a good to use the tiddly web terminology because we've inherited um, the URL routes that tiddly web uses and you know, that terminology. Eric, I'm really sorry. Do you no, quite all right, quite all right. Um, in terms of uh, finding the dependencies, back in the to the classic day, I have a plugin called Related Tiddlers plugin, and um, in into the classic, each tiddler has a links array, which is um, a, sort of extracted from the body of the tiddler, which is the, all the things that it links to, and. Um, there's also uh, you can also find out what it sh what it transcludes. Anyway, so I, I wrote this plugin that does a recursive walk of the starting from one root tiddler, find all the related tiddlers based upon whether it's links or or mm -hmm. transclusion or what have you. And um, what I found was that almost universally, either you got just the one tiddler with a, a handful of other similar isolated tiddlers, or you got one tiddler that expanded out to include almost all of the wiki, because there's, there's the dependency tree is actually um, quite extensive. Um, mm -hmm. So the question is, now some of these things that it was depending upon were style sheets and things like that, which technically it really didn't depend upon. The content could have been bundled without the styling and it would have been perfectly fine. So the question about what goes into a bundle, if you start with some sort of automated, you know, walk the, the relationships between things, you'll end up with something that really isn't all that much better than just taking the whole pile. Um, so mm. the question is how to decide where to, if you start saying, well, that's the, that's the maximum you would take, is just the, the, the spanning tree Okay. Of the, you know, but then if you prune him back from that, who does that and how do you decide what not to take? I think the thing that's different in this situation that's quite interesting is that what you were saying there is, it maps onto um, ideas about mapping, um, sorry, about modeling dependency relationships um, through um, exposed fields and so on on tiddlers. So it's about um, we define a convention for a tiddler to say I depend on this other tiddler. Um, what's quite interesting about the Plugin Library Federation approach is it allows us to push that logic into the server. So the, um, the client can say to the server, um, give me um, all the things that are associated with this thing, 
And then the server figures out what associated might mean. So the author of that wiki determines what relationships constitute this you know, the, uh, bundling, um, asset bundling. Um, and that's quite interesting because it means it's the same old, same old with APIs. It means that we can fix an API that we can be reasonably confident is you know, reasonably future-proof, but evolve lots of different conventions for how you actually model those dependencies, all of which can fit behind the same API. Sorry, I've rather labored that point, but um, it's uh, justifying, the <laughs> justifying the architecture that I've so proudly <laughs> shown off to you. Um, any further thoughts about that? Because I'm afraid I must draw to a close. As before, um, the you know the discussion can carry on in my absence, but we'll stop the broadcast and so on. So, any further closing um, thoughts, questions, anything? Okay. Guys, thank you very much. Oh, Jed has fired in. Is there any news about 5.1.8? Um, uh, good, very good question. Um, I think by now um, we are, as usual, um, a week or two past the point at which I'd hoped 5.1.8 would be released. Um, I think that um, the next step might be another um, post to the group about the pre-release and try and get a little bit more feedback. I'd like a few people to try the plugin library in the wild um, at our current release schedule of trying to, you know, not not have releases too frequently. Um, that makes it quite important that, you know, I get as much of the plugin library stuff right first time as possible. Um, any other thoughts, comments, questions? So, it remains, sorry, I didn't leave a very long gap for you to say yes. Well, I want to thank, thank you very much for everything you've done. I mean, mm -hmm. Nick, well, in fact, I was going to thank you guys. Um, the, uh, I, you know, I always say the same old things, really. Mm -hmm. These Hangouts are very easy for me. Um, uh, it's, it's everybody standing around paying attention to the thing that spends most of its time in my head. Oh, that's not quite expressed the right, right way around. Um, uh, but it's a huge time commitment. I greatly appreciate you making the time to come along. And um, the only thing that makes the Hangouts rewarding is obviously the participation of other people. And I haven't yet had to do a Hangout on my own where I'm talking to an empty room. But um, uh, I think this is way better than that. So I say a huge thank you to you and um, you know, deeper thank you for all the other contributions um, behind this that you've, you know, behind com beyond coming to the the Hangouts, which you have all made. So thank you very much. And with that, we'll wave goodbye, and I'll press the Stop Broadcast button. Cheers, then. Bye.